Hi everyone, welcome back to Mad Barn Academy. And if you're new here, welcome. We hope to earn your subscription today. I figured it was about time to tackle gastric ulcers since it is such a common condition and it's one that our team deals with on a daily basis. So because this is such a big topic, I decided to break it down into a three-part series. Our focus for today will be on the differences between squamous and glandular ulcers, which means we'll need to cover some background information on stomach anatomy and physiology. In the following videos, we'll cover diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and dietary management strategies, which is where our nutrition team at Mad Barn really shines. All right, well, let's get started for today. So equine gastric ulcer syndrome is one of the most common GI diseases or issues diagnosed in horses. We'll discuss the particulars in more detail soon, but horses have two distinct areas of their stomach, the upper squamous portion and the lower glandular portion. Ulcers can develop in either area or both if your horse is particularly unlucky. The reason this is important is because the different um, is because the disease processes are different for these different types of ulcers, which means that treatment is different for each of them. This is why getting an accurate diagnosis is so important. You have to know what area uh, of the stomach you're dealing with so that you can treat it correctly and address the underlying risk factors to prevent future ulcers. Most of us horse owners are probably all too familiar with ulcers. Either one of our own horses has been affected or we know a horse that struggles with a history of ulcers. I know there are a lot of numbers on this slide, but really what I wanted to demonstrate here is just how common both squamous and glandular ulcers are across all populations of horses. For me, the biggest takeaway when sifting through these numbers is that EGUS is extremely prevalent in all populations of competition horses, regardless of discipline or level. EGUS may also even be more common than is documented in our non-competition horses, like our broodmares or pasture pets or retirees, uh, just due to sampling bias, meaning these horses are probably less likely to be scoped compared to the high-performing athletes. So to understand why ulcers form, we have to first uh, have a basic understanding of the horse's stomach anatomy and physiology. As I already mentioned, the equine stomach can be split into two distinct areas, the upper squamous portion and the lower glandular portion. And you can really easily tell these two areas apart when you're looking at the stomach in real life. The squamous portion, uh, which is label one in our diagrams here, is light pink, while the glandular portion, label two, is going to be kind of a darker, uh, more purpley pink color. And they're separated by a fold of tissue um, kind of around the entirety of the stomach, uh, which is called the Margo placatus. Two other notable anatomical features of the equine stomach are the esophageal opening, which is label three, and the pylorus, which is label four. The esophagus opens into the stomach at the cardia, and you can actually see uh, the scope coming through the esophageal opening in that upper right-hand picture. Uh, that scope comes in, and then it's circling around and then giving us that uh, frontal view. The pylorus is the exit from the stomach where ingesta then moves from the stomach into the small intestine. It sits uh, essentially directly below the esophageal opening, kind of under this little shelf or fold of tissue. 
in the upper right hand picture, we can't see the pylorus because it's covered by that puddle of gastric acid. But if we insufflate the stomach with more air uh, during this gastroscopic exam, we'll be able to kind of drop down below that shelf, um, but sit kind of above that puddle of uh, gastric acid, and we'll be able to visualize the pylorus fully, which you can see in that uh, lower right hand picture. So that's sort of big picture. Now let's take things down to the cellular level. The entire interior of the stomach is lined with epithelial cells, and we can kind of differentiate those as either squamous epithelium or glandular epithelium, depending on the region we're talking about. In the glandular region specifically, special cells uh, called parietal cells produce gastric acid or hydrochloric acid. Horses are interesting because they are basal acid secretors, which means that they continuously produce HCL regardless of feed consumption. This differs from other species like ourselves, and uh, which only produce acid in response to food actually entering the stomach. And this is a really important consideration because it means that that glandular epithelium is in contact with hydrochloric acid all the time which is not great. Uh, our cells don't want to be in contact with a highly corrosive substance um, day after day. Fortunately, the glandular epithelium has a defense mechanism. The production of a mucus layer that actually creates kind of this physical barrier um, that protects the cell surface from that harmful gastric acid. Additionally, uh, the epithelial cells will secrete bicarbonate ions, which buffers gastric acid uh, close to the cell surface. So in this uh, really nice figure here, you can see that at the mucosal surface, the pH uh, of that, uh, those gastric contents is actually very neutral, uh, around a pH of seven, uh, which is like water. And then the farther away you move from that cell surface, um, the lower that pH is going to get until it's uh, the pH of that hydrochloric acid, which is around two. Okay, so now we're going to take all of that kind of basic knowledge and, and really apply it to what goes wrong. Why do ulcers actually form and what, what happens in the stomach to, to cause this problem. In the most simplistic terms, ulcers develop due to an imbalance between what scientists have termed mucosal aggressive factors and mucosal protective factors. So those aggressive factors are um, basically all those harsh components of that gastric juice used to initiate digestion. So namely, that hydrochloric acid, but there's a couple other things in there as well. The protective factors are exactly what we just talked about. The, that mucus and bicarbonate layer that sits on the surface of the glandular epithelium and acts as a, uh, a, a protective film, essentially. So on the previous slide, I was really specific about how that mucus layer in the bicarbonate secretion protect the glandular epithelium. That's because the glandular region is the one that has those def defense mechanisms. The squamous region does not. So no mucus barrier, no bicarb secretion from those squamous epithelial cells. When we think about what that means and why ulcers form in these different locations, we can start to see why there are kind of two different disease processes or two different etiologies for ulcer formation in these two distinct regions of the stomach. So ulcers develop in the squamous portion due to exposure to stomach acid. Those cells aren't meant to come into contact or at least prolong contact with, with the gastric acid. On the other hand, those glandular cells are meant to be in contact with, with stomach acid day in and day out. So when we get ulcers forming in the glandular portion, it's because there has been compromise or disruption of those protective mechanisms. 
Okay, so let's talk about risk factors for each of these types of ulcers. For squamous ulcers, we know that prolonged exposure to stomach acid damages the epithelium, erodes those cells away and creates ulcers. It's likely that the severity of those ulcers is related to the length of time of acid exposure. So some of the most um, common risk factors or, or best accepted risk factors for squamous ulcers include a fasting or inconsistent access to forage between meals. So forage really acts kind of as a mat or kind of a a physical barrier that's going to prevent acid from splashing around and splashing up onto that squamous epithelium. Feeding diets high in carbohydrates or feeding large concentrate meals, which lower the pH of the gastric acid, making it even more harsh, even more corrosive. High intensity exercise, which increases intra abdominal pressure and actually pushes acid up into that squamous portion of the stomach. And then a, some type of decreased rate of clearance from the stomach, like um, a decreased gastric motility or a delayed gastric emptying syndrome. For glandular ulcers, we know that these form due to disruption or weakening of those protective mechanisms, such as uh, reduced blood flow to the stomach, reduced mucus secretion, and reduced bicarbonate secretion. So risk factors for glandular ulcers include uh, physical stress or illness, greater than four days per week of exercise, really regardless of intensity, and then inappropriate use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as bute or banamine. And what inappropriate use means is really uh, overdosing these drugs, dosing them too frequently, which is really just another form of overdose, or prolonged use over time. Okay, that is a wrap on part one of our equine gastric ulcer syndrome series. In the next video, we'll move on to diagnosis and treatment. So here are my references for today. I'm sorry the text is so small. I just had a lot of really good references to list here. And I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Explore the other videos on our channel. I've included a couple links to a few of our blog articles on gastric ulcers uh, in the description of the video below. So feel free to check those out for some more information or more detail uh, about gastric ulcers. And then uh, next video uh, will be on treatment, uh, diagnosis and treatment. That will be part two. So I hope to see you back for that. Uh, until next time, thanks everyone.